I can get this working. Uh, good morning. God, so good to be here. I'm glad I got that part over with. Uh, wow, I do love motorcycles, and uh, I had the opportunity last week to be with some incredible men in the way out back in Kenya, middle of nowhere, uh, riding with our mobile messengers. And we had six or seven U.S. pastors along with us, and we had just an incredible time uh, watching these pastors fall and get up and wreck and crash. Uh, we had one guy that we had to have a doctor waiting for us in Nairobi when we got back, but they hung in there and they went with us and we kept seeing incredible things along the way. Uh, one would be this, we'd be going down just a dirt trail. I mean, uh, Jeeps couldn't go there, only motorcycles. And uh, you'd look down at the end of the trail there and there it was, you'd see the mobile messenger's motorcycle. And you'd come around uh, uh, just a field of corn and there to your right would be like four sticks and a tarp, 25, 30 people under that tarp just praising God. Three to six months earlier, nobody in that area even had ever seen a Bible, much less knew the name of Jesus. The mobile messenger had come in and just really one person at a time, he'd, he'd led to Jesus Christ and slowly but surely families came together to know the Lord and uh, what we saw that particular day was this mobile messenger teaching and training and coaching a guy there in the village to be the pastor so he could move on. And that's a little bit about what With Open Eyes does. I want to talk to you today about a number of things, but I got to just stop and catch my breath and just uh, thank the Lord. So let's just pray for a moment. Lord God Almighty, I do thank you for getting me up here safely. And I just pray that your powerful Holy Spirit would uh, move in my life right now. You, you know what I need to say to this audience. You know what they need to hear. Prepare their hearts and minds, Lord, uh, to hear what it is you want them to, to hear and to do. Pray, Lord God, that we would be aggressive for you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was asked not long ago uh, as a business person, as a Coca-Cola business person, uh, by the head of a large U.S. ministry, he said, and I think this is why he wanted to talk to me, he said, Frank, you got to explain to me, how does Coca-Cola get to the most remote, far-out regions of the world and the gospel still not there? You know, you go to villages out in the middle of nowhere and you can always find a Coke. And I told him, I said, you know, I've played that Coke game many times myself over the years. Most remote areas of Sudan, Tajikistan, I've tried it and it's never failed yet. I'll ask for a Coke. And I don't think I've waited longer than 10 or 15 minutes. Just a beat up, banged up glass bottle of Coke will come up, hot but delicious. And, uh, you know, you drink a Coke. So, I'm not going to go into the answer I gave this guy. We don't have the time to do that uh, as to why Coke is there and the gospel isn't. But I tell you what, it, with open eyes uh, and, and all of us here, I want to do something about that. And I would tell you that the purpose of what we're doing with these motorcycles and these pastors is really to accelerate the powerful gospel message of Jesus Christ. We come alongside pastors uh, in, in remote areas and just bring them transportation and supplies helping them reach the unreached and underserved uh, populations of the world. And really, that's our purpose. But I want to begin this morning by asking you uh, the purpose question. You know, why are you here? Why are you here on this earth? I got asked it not long ago. It's kind of fresh on my mind. And uh, it was one of these business magazine interviews, which I never do, don't like to do, but I agreed to do this one. And believe it or not, the first two questions out of this lady's mouth was, Mr. Harrison, what is your purpose in life and what is the legacy that you want to leave at Coca-Cola Consolidated? And I just, I thought, I said, I asked her right back. I said, ma'am, have you ever asked a business executive that question before? And she said, no, never have. And I said, well, why'd you ask me? I'm kind of stalling for time. And she said, well, we did a little research on you. Thought you'd give us a good answer. And uh, I struggled through that, gave her an answer or two. But uh, and a matter of fact, that was on a Friday, on Monday. We we're doing a project there at Coke, and we had the three big U.S. consultants in, McKinsey, Booz, and Bain. We were trying to solve this big issue, and we brought them in one at a time, and I believe the McKinsey people were first, and they began telling us all about their firm, and I said, hold just a minute, listen, I'd like to just sort of get to know you all a little bit up front. And so my first question was to each of them, could you tell me what your purpose is in life? And uh, I mean, these are Harvard, Yale, MIT, really smart people. And all I would tell you is during that day with the three groups, not one of them even came close to telling me what their purpose in life was. 
And then this legacy thing, that's not light. That's a, you know, she said, what's your legacy? When we die, we're all going to leave a legacy. Uh, you know, I just, uh, as I think about legacy, the first thought is my son James. Uh, you noticed in the film, we lost James uh, a little over a year ago in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, when I got the call from the U.S. Embassy that James had died, I shot over there, of course, and to bring his body back. And uh, I got in a little hotel room that night with a couple of the Coke people, and just oddly enough, these are the two, I just had time to slow down for a few minutes, and these two thoughts came to me, first of all. Number one, this might even sound a little selfish, but I just, I, I realized that our name, you know, the Harrison name wouldn't be going on anymore. We have three daughters and a son. Those of you with daughters are over that, but it just hit me. And then I thought, wow, James wouldn't be working in the Coca-Cola business. He would have been like fifth generation in our family to work in this business. But real quickly after that, I mean, 30 seconds within that, I said, wait a minute, Frank, that is so unimportant, your name and the Coke business. What really matters is the legacy that we leave in Christ, the legacy that we, live in, that we leave in people that goes on forever and ever. And of course, an important part of James's legacy has been this wonderful organization called With Open Eyes. But I've been thinking about as a business person also over the last, really the last decade, about this whole subject of purpose and legacy. And, uh, you know, a company is uh, a lot of people, uh, but I believe it has a purpose also. Uh, and I would just tell you that some of the first thoughts that came to me about this subject was this. I began to realize, I think for the first time, that someday I would be held accountable before the Lord God Almighty for our business, for our company, in terms of the influence and the impact that we were having for Christ. Now, I understood personal accountability before my life. I got that. I understood accountability before shareholders for the health and growth of the business, but accountability before God for the influence and the impact for Him on our 6,000 employees and their family and where they were going to spend eternity and all that. I'd never really dealt with that. And I was thinking, you know, religion in the workplace, where, where is this going? What is this all about? And uh, all I can tell you is I didn't know what to do. So we started praying. And uh, that was one of our first prayer groups probably 10 years ago. But things began to happen. I'm just going to quickly tell you this story. Uh, first thing, I ran into a friend of mine uh, who mentioned to me, Frank, I put a chaplain in my manufacturing plant. It's been a good thing. And I remember thinking so clearly, all right, a chaplain in the Coke plant, public company, 100-year-old business, that's got to be illegal. Just totally let it go. Within two weeks of that, I got a call from the sheriff there in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. He said, Frank, uh, would you like to do some shooting down at the jail? So I came down, and we were shooting these targets. Uh, the screen came down, and I think it was a bank robbery, and a mom and a baby was held hostage, and you had to shoot the uh, bank robber without shooting the mom and the baby, and I did hit the baby a couple of times. Did not mean to. But I'm in there walking around, and I saw this office. It said chaplain, and I asked the sheriff, hey, you got a chaplain, city government? And he said, yeah, we put a chaplain in. It's been a good thing. Just within a couple of weeks of that, I'm down at Clemson University. I've been down there three times in my life, but we're thanking them for the Coke business, and I'm walking around with a coach at that time, Tommy Bowden. We go by an office. It says chaplain, and I'm thinking, okay, public university, you know, and the coach said, yeah, we got a chaplain. We want to win football games. And... <laughs> This is uh, really the spring of the year, you know, the Coke 600 there in Charlotte. We sponsor that race, and I'm at the driver's meeting, and uh, right after the driver's meeting, they have a chapel service, which is a very smart thing to do if you're going to be racing around that track for the next six hours. But I noticed a lot of those teams, they all had chaplains. So long story short, I go to work on Monday and say, guys, we need to look in this chaplain thing. I think it's maybe a good thing. So we decided to do a test in our Nashville, Tennessee Coke plant, put in two chaplains. And you got to understand these people are all trained counselors and pastors and 10 years work experience. And all I would tell you quickly is that after six to nine months of those chaplains being in place down there, we got a call from our HR folks and they said, hey, Frank, if you pull these chaplains, we're going to have a revolt on our hands. It's incredible what's going on here. The families that have been restored and the marriages that have been put back together, kids that have been gotten out of jail. And, and then during this time, there was a... Uh, uh, actually, during this little test period, uh, there was a death there, and this employee had come to know Christ through the chaplain. His family didn't have a church, and they asked if they could have the funeral at the Coke plant. I didn't even know anything about it, but they had the funeral back on the loading docks, and I understand 13 people came to Christ at the funeral. 
So from there, you know, we realized, whoa, this is a strong thing. And we began to spread it out throughout the company. And uh, now we have chaplains at all of our locations. And I would be here all afternoon, all morning, talking to you about the stories and the things that have happened and the people that have come to Christ. And when, when you, just on the marriage piece, when you, with the counseling, just like your churches, our employees have all kinds of issues. But when you put marriages back together, when it, the, the loyalty and, and all that that creates for a business is incredible. Uh, I would tell you today, too, that the last dollars I would cut as a businessman would be the dollars we spend on these chaplains uh, because of what they're doing for our company and our people. But from there, the chaplains 10 years ago was something that just got us started, I believe. And we began to realize we need to start getting our people involved in serving others and this whole idea of servant leadership. So we started what we call our stewardship programs. And today we probably have 30 going on throughout the Southeast where we serve prisoners and we serve orphans and we serve abused children. And one location basically takes care of the homeless in that area. And uh, uh, I was just thinking about a little store I was in the other day, Phil's Deli, just a little deli store there in Charlotte. And we walked in and the owner there was telling everybody in the restaurant about Coca-Cola and what we had done. I, I, we had a group of our people that helped refurbish an orphanage that he was deeply involved with. And I only tell you that story, just there's so many of those stories and it's the right thing to do and we're teaching our people how to serve and what comes from that. But it's also so good for business. That little store owner would never sell anything but Coca-Cola in his store. You know, from there, I would tell you as a business, as a company, even as a church, we started taking a hard look at our giving. You know, as a Coca-Cola bottler in these territories throughout the Southeast, we give, have for years from the Cub Scout, Boy Scouts to Clemson University and everything in between. But we'd never really, as a company, as a public company, never really given to organizations that were truly having an eternal impact on those that they were ministering to. You know, if you give to a church, you know, you gotta give to another church, right? And what about his church? And then you might have to give to a synagogue and a, a temple and a mosque. I mean, you just kind of don't go there, right? And uh, we, we hadn't until about 10 years ago. And then we woke up and realized, now, wait a minute, you know, who, who owns it all? Whose money is it? Who are we going to be held accountable for it someday or to someday? And we began to change and we began to give. And I won't go into all the details of that right now, but we're, we're learning every year about what, what is right. And as a business, what should you give? You know, uh, I think Personally, I've somewhat got it, tithing and offering, but as a business, should it be X percent of pre-tax income, operating income? What should it be? And we're still working through all that, but I want to tell you, you can't outgive God. Two years ago, as we went into 2010, we'd had with this economy, we'd had about three or four years of flat operating income. And just, I felt at the end of the year, we weren't giving enough. Uh, so we doubled our giving that year. And uh, at the end of uh, 2010, our, our operating income was up right at 30%, which was wonderful. But uh, <clears throat> so after giving, another thing I want you just to think about in your businesses, churches, and other organizations is purpose. We're, we're going to come back to purpose here in just a minute. But again, as I said, I think a company has a purpose. We had a mission. And it was all about being the best, you know, Coca-Cola company. And, but uh, as we began to really think and pray about purpose, we realized that was deeper and stronger and more forever. And I would just tell you real quickly, our purpose now at Coke Consolidated is to honor God in all we do, to serve others, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. And you know, to honor God in all we do, that's a huge accountability thing for all of our people. And it's all about our values and uh, it's all about asking the question, all right, does this decision really honor God? What would Jesus do here? And sometimes it's more complicated than you think. Two or three weeks ago, I got a call from our, some of our folks and there was a new energy drink we're coming out with and they were telling me about a well-known professional wrestler that was going to be the sponsor of this energy drink. And I sort of got it, you know, NASCAR or wrestling and, and uh, energy drinks, you know. But then uh, uh, my son-in-law sent me an article about this particular wrestler and uh, I won't go into all the details of that, but I mean, everything you can imagine was said about this guy. How much of this was true, I don't know, but you know, really described him as a very, very difficult, <laughs> challenging young man. Uh, and, uh, well, what do we do? Uh, the easy thing to have done there would have been to just drop this wrestler. But I, when I really asked the question, what would Jesus do here? Would he just cut him off and be done with him? I realized, no, he wouldn't. So before I knew it, I, I had the guy come into our office and I was having lunch with him. 
And he began to tell me, uh, first of all, Frank, you just don't worry about that stuff you're reading in the paper. I'm a celebrity. People write stuff about me. It's not true. And of course, we later found out a lot of the stuff was true. But we had a wonderful conversation. And after he finished, I mean, about an hour telling me how great he was, I said, you know, Mr. Wrestler, uh, listen, there, there's a God that loves you so much. It's incredible. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. You don't have to live wild and crazy like this. this. There is so much that you could do for God if you would just give your life to him and walk with him. And Then I invited him to go with me, uh, do some prison ministry to come with me on a, on a prison visit. He said, I'll go with you. He said, listen, Frank, they love me in the prisons. And I said, well, I'm sure they do, you know, and just come on and go with me. But I could talk a lot about what it truly means to honor God, but to serve others, that is so, so heavy and so powerful for, for all of us, but especially as business people, when we learn to truly, truly serve, to put the needs of others before our own, I mean, truly serve each other, but truly serve our customers. And I'm not talking about just delivering the greatest products in the world and the best pricing strategy. There's a little convenience store on the other side of Charlotte. Uh, in a little town of Waxhaw that's on the way to our farm. And my son-in-law, Jay, and I were riding motorcycles one Sunday afternoon, and we came through there, and we stopped to visit this little store, which I will tell you, at that time anyway, was selling way too much of the blue stuff. I won't say a bad word in here, but... And I've been trying for about three years to convert this guy, and uh, our head of sales actually lives in this little town of Waxhaw. No luck with this guy. But we're in there that Sunday afternoon and uh, slowed down, and we're talking with this guy and getting to know him better and I find out that he's got a son here in the country, but his daughter can't get in the country. And I just start showing some real interest and compassion for that. And he said, Frank, it's a terrible thing, you know, when your child can't get in the country. And I said, you know, maybe there's a way we can help. And he got kind of teary-eyed once. And then Jan, my wife, called and said, Frank, are we going to church tonight? And I said, yeah, we're going to church. And hung up. He said, do you go to church? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I hadn't been to church in years, but I used to lead one of the large choirs in South Korea. And so I, I invited him to church, you know, uh, and we left. And that was the end of that conversation. A month later, I'm, I'm driving back through there. I happened to have the president of our company with us. And I said, hey, I want you to meet this Chris Kim guy from South Korea. And uh, so we go, well, no, we pull up to the store and we look off to the left. And I mean, just heaped up, stacked up, was blue Pepsi equipment all over, stacked up outside. We walked inside this store and it looked like a, a Coke museum in there. I mean, Coca-Cola <laughs> stuff everywhere. And you know, I didn't, I didn't have to even talk with that guy. I realized what had happened. You know, I finally slowed down long enough, was willing to serve him and stopped trying to do all this selling just, just to serve him. And uh, so we're learning a lot about what it, I mean, of course, Jesus set the total model for servant leadership, and it's so powerful for all of us with our families, with our wives and husbands, and, and surely with our customers and in business. And uh, we, we just want to uh, just honor God by the way uh, we're doing our business. Um, and I want to come back to, to you and this whole subject of uh, uh, purpose and legacy. Uh, before I went to Africa a week or so ago, God just gave me this verse. It was John 12, 24, Jesus talking. Most assuredly, I say unto you, with assurance, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. The Lord God wants us to produce much grain. I want to challenge you here at the end just to, to be, to give it all up to Jesus, to be willing to lose your life for Jesus, uh, to be aggressive for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we were coming back last week from the bush there in Kenya, we came into Nairobi on these motorcycles, and I got six pastors I got to kind of look after. And I'd always said, I'd never drive a car in Nairobi. That place is crazy wild. Well, we're coming through there on motorcycles. And our leader, uh, an African guy named Evans, uh, he was just darting in and out of the traffic. I mean, he said, we'll be here for hours or we can get through this in about 30 minutes. So somehow or another, we all followed him and we were going over sidewalks. We were, just like you see, you know, when you've been in those type places, we were doing it. And I'll be honest with you, it was more fun than you can imagine. We were taking risk after risk and just darting and moving and going. But I'm going to tell you, being a, my son James uh, was a major risk taker. I had somebody tell me the other day, one of his friends, Mr. Harrison, you know, James wasn't afraid of anybody. And I said, yeah, oh yeah, I know. And uh, uh, the man that was just up here before me, Franklin Graham, that's a risk taker. And God has blessed his ministry incredibly. Listen, I want you to not get held up in traffic. You know, don't be so ministry minded. What is that? You know, earthly good, you know, don't have to have all these detailed plans. When you see an opportunity, you take it and you go and you shoot the gap. 
and you move out for Jesus uh, because he's going to put somebody else in there if you don't do it. And listen, you're going to die someday. Life is short. James is 27. God took him home. Uh, you're going to have a legacy. I want you to have a powerful, strong legacy that impacts people for eternity. And God bless you, and thank you for listening this morning. <laughs>